Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier. We're here with IBM to talk about big data, big data analytics, and uh, we're doing a first ever crowd chat simulcast of live feed uh, with IBM. So uh, guys, we're going to try this out. Uh, it is like go to crowdchat.net slash Hadoop next and join the conversation. And uh, our, our guests here, Rob Thomas, Vice President of Product Development, Big Data Analyst at IBM, and Beth Smith, General Manager of IBM Analytics Platform. Guys, welcome to, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Welcome back. Good and so here. IBM, obviously, we're super excited to, uh, next week is obviously Interconnect, your big That's event. Right. You guys mashed up three shows for the mega shows. And, and um, Aerosmith's playing, so I just got to say, I'm from <laughs> Boston there, so I'm really excited <laughs> about you know, Aerosmith and all the activities, the social lounge and, and whatnot. But you know, we've been following you guys, the transformation of IBM, is really impressive. You guys have certainly taken a lot of heat in the press in terms of some of the performance size in the business, but it's pumping right now. You guys seem to have great positioning. The stories are, are hanging together. Huge customer base, huge services. So we're at the big data world, which is, tends to be startup driven from the past few years. Over the past phase one, the big companies came in and started saying, hey, you know, there's a big market here. Our customers see demand in that. So I got your take on, on as we're coming into Interconnect uh, next, next week, what is the perspective of big data? Obviously, Watson has garnered headlines from powering toys to Jeopardy to solving huge world problems. That's a big data problem. You guys are not new to big data. So when you look at this big data week here in Silicon Valley, what's the take? Sure, so I'll start off and then Beth can add in. So our big focus is how we start to bring data to the masses. And we start to think in terms of personas Data science it plays an increasingly important role around big data and how people are accessing that. The developer community, and then obviously the line of business community, which is the, the client set that IBM has been serving for years. But the announcements that we've made this week around Hadoop are really focused on the first two personas in terms of data scientists, how they start to get better value out of Hadoop, leveraging different tools, so we'll talk about what some of those are. And so we're really starting to change it about, Hadoop is ultimately about insight. It's not about infrastructure. Infrastructure is interesting, but it's really about what you're getting out of it, and so that's why we're approaching it that way. And and it ties, well, it ties naturally to IBM's strategy around data, cloud, and engagement, and data is really about using the insights, which, like Rob said, it's about the value you can get from the data, and how that can be used then to transform professions and industries. And I think when we, bring it back to big data and the topic of Hadoop, I think, frankly, it has gotten to a point that clients are really beginning to say it's time to scale. They're seeing the value in the technology, what it can bring, how it gives them some diversity in their data and analytics platform, and they're ready to now scale um, their workloads as a part of it. So the theme is Hadoop next, okay? so. That takes us right to the next point, which is, okay, what's next? So say phase one, okay, we've got some base position validation. Okay, this new environment, customers are, want that. So, so what is next? I mean, we're hearing things like in memory's hot, obviously Spark has proven that there's an action in memory. That, that kind of says, okay, analytics at the speed of business is something that's important. You guys are all over that, and, and we've heard some things from you guys. So, so what's, how do we get to the next part where we take Hadoop as an as a infrastructure opportunity and put it into practice for solutions. How, what, what are the key things that you guys see happening that must happen for the large customers to be successful? So I think that actually ties into the announcements we made this week around the open data platform um, because that's about getting that core platform to ensure that there's standardization around it, there's interoperability around it, and then that's the base. And that vendors and clients are coming together to do that and to really enable and facilitate the community to be able to standardize around that. Then it's about the value on top of that, around it, et cetera. It's about the workloads and what could be brought to bear to extend up that. How do you apply it to real-time streaming? How do you add things like machine learning? How do you deal with things like text analytics? I mean, we have a, we have a client situation where um, the client took four billion tweets 
and were able to analyze that to identify over 110 million profiles of individuals. And then by integrating and analyzing that data with the client internal data sources of about seven or eight different data sources, they were able to narrow in to 1.7 million profiles that matched at at least 90% precision. You know, now they've got data that they can apply on buying patterns and stuff. It's about that. It's about going up the stack. We could have talked for hours and hours. <laughs> My mind's exploding. Privacy, creepy. I mean, a persona is relevant because now you talk about personalization. I mean, collective intelligence has been an AI concept. We try not to be creepy. You just know, <laughs> you know, the users go, okay, cool, but now, so that brings us to the next level. I mean, you guys were talking about cognitive is, on, uh, is a word you guys kick around. Also, systems of engagement. Systems of record is an old term that's been around. You know, the old data warehouse and dates fenced off resources of, of disk and, and data, but now with systems of engagement, real time, in the moment, immersive experience, which is essentially the social and or kind of mobile experience. What does that mean? I mean, how do you guys get there? How do you make it so it's better for the users, uh, more secure? I mean, these are hot button issues that kind of lead us right to that point. So I'll take it that a couple ways. So, so first of all, your first question around Hadoop next. So Hadoop is no longer just an IT discussion. That's what I've seen change dramatically in the last six months. I was with the CEO of one of the world's largest banks just uh, three days ago. And the CEO is asking about Hadoop. So there's a great interest in this topic. And so, so why? So why would a CEO even care? I think one is people are starting to understand the use cases of the place. So Beth talks about entity extraction. So how you start to look at customer records that you have um, internally in your systems of record, to your point, John. And then you, you know, how do you match that against what's happening in the social world, which is more of the engagement piece. So there's a clear use case around that that changes how clients you know, work with their, with their customers. So, so that's one reason. Second is huge momentum in this idea of a logical data warehouse. We no longer think of the data infrastructure as, oh, it's a warehouse or it's a database. Also meaning not physically tied to something. Not tied to just a relational store. So you can have a warehouse, but you can scale in Hadoop. You can provision data back and forth. You can write queries from either side. Um, that's what we're doing, is we're enabling clients to modernize their infrastructure with this type of a log logical data warehouse approach. When you take those kinds of use cases and then you put the data science tools on top of it, suddenly, our customers can develop a different relationship with their customers, and they can really start to change the way that, that they're doing business. Uh, Beth, I want to get your comments. We have the CrowdChat. CrowdChat.net slash Hadoop Next, some commentary coming in. I see transforming industries, billion tweets, killer for customer experience, so customer experience, um, uh, and then also the link about the data science uh, into high gear. So let's bring that now into the data science. So the logical you know, stores, okay, makes sense with virtualization, things are moving around. You have some sort of cognitive engines out there that can overlay on top of that. Customer experience and data science, how are they interplaying? Because this came out in some of the retail event at New York City that happened last week. Point of purchase, personalization, customer experience, data science, it's all rolling together. Right. What does that mean? Unpack that for us and, and simplify it if you can. <laughs> Oh, wow. It's, kind of, well, it's, it, it's it, complex. I mean, it's it a big topic. Yeah. You know, it's a big topic. So um, a couple of different points. So first of all, I think it is about enabling the data scientists to be able to do what they their specialty is. And the technologies have advanced to allow them to do that. And then it's about them having the, the data and the different forms of data and the analytics at their fingertips to be able to apply that. I think the, the other point in, in it, though, is that the lines are blurring between the person that is the data scientist and the business user that needs to worry about how do they attract new customers or how do they you know, create new business models and what do they use as a part of it. I do think we're also seeing that line blurring. One of the things that we're trying to do is is help the industry around growing skills. So we actually have Big Data University. We have, what, 230,000 participants um, in this online free education. And we're expanding that topic now to, again, go up the stack, to go into the things that data scientists want to deal with, like machine learning, to go into things that the business user really wants to now be able to um, capture as a part of it. 
So I'm going to ask you guys kind of more of I mean, could be a product question and or kind of a market mm -hmm. question. At the, uh, IBM's TED at IBM event, in heat, you saw, talked about a big medical example and one of her favorite use cases. But she made a comment in there, uh, active data. Active data is not a new term for the data geeks out there, but we look at data science, lag is really important. Real near real time is not going to make it for airplanes and people crossing the street with mobile devices. So real, real time mm -hmm. means like that second latency is really important. Speed, so active data is a big part of that. So can you guys talk about passive active data and how that relates to computing and, because uh, it's all kind of coming together. It's not an obvious thing, but she highlighted that in her presentation, because obviously with, with medical medical care is obviously urgent, you know, in the moment kind of thing. So what does that all mean? I mean, is, is that something customers should be paying attention to? Is it viable? Is it doable? So certainly viable. I mean, it's a huge opportunity, and, and I'd say probably the most famous story we have around that is the work that we did at the University of Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children where we were using real-time streaming algorithms and a real-time streaming engine to monitor um, infants in the neonatal care uh, facility. And this was a million data points coming off of a, a human body monitoring in real time. And so why is that relevant? I mean, it's pretty, pretty basic actually. If you extract the data, you ETL it somewhere, you load it in a warehouse, then you start to say, well, what's going on? It's way too late. You know, we're talking about you know, at the moment you need to know what's happening. And so it started as a lot was in the medical field, which, you know, to some of the examples that you mentioned, but real time is now going well beyond the medical field. You know, places from retail at the point of sale and how things are happening to even things like farming. Um, so real time is here to stay. We don't really view that as different from what I would describe as Hadoop Next because streaming to me is part of what we're doing with Hadoop and with Spark, which we'll talk about in a bit. So it's certainly, um, it is it's a new paradigm for many clients, but it's going to be much more common. Yeah, actually, if I can add, there's a client, North Carolina State University, it's where I went to school, so it's a, <laughs> if it, it's a client that I talk about a lot, but they, in addition to what they do with their students, they also work with a lot of businesses on um, different opportunities that they, may, that they may have, and they have a big data and analytics sort of um, extended education, um, business education um, project. As a part of that, they are now um, prepared to be able to analyze one petabyte in near real time. So the examples that you and Rob talked about of the real world workloads that are gonna exist where real time matters um, are there, there's no doubt about it, they're not going away, and the technology is prepared to be able to handle the massive amount of data and analytics that needs to happen right there in real time. You know, that's a great exa great point. I mean, these flagship examples are kind of like lighthouses for people to look at and kind of the ships that kind of come into the harbor, if you will, for other customers. Obviously, you always have the early adopters. Um, can you guys talk about where the mainstream market is right now? Obviously, from a services standpoint, you guys have great presence in a lot of accounts. Um, where are these ships coming into? Which harbor? Where are the lighthouses? Obviously, medical, you mentioned some of those examples of bringing in the main customers. Is it the new apps that are driving it? What innovations and what are the forces and what are the customers doing in the mainstream right now? Where are they in the evolution of moving to these kind of higher end examples? So, I mean, so Hadoop, I'd say this is the year Hadoop where clients have become serious about Hadoop. Like I said, it's now become a, a board level topic. Um, so it's, it's at the forefront right now. Um, I see clients being very aggressive about trying out new use cases. Everybody, really across every interest, industry is looking for one thing, which is growth. And the way that you get growth if you're a bank is you're not really gonna change your asset structure. What you're gonna change is how you engage with clients and how you personalize offers. If you're a retailer, you're not gonna grow by simply adding more stores. Um, it might be a, a short-term growth impact, but you're gonna change how you're engaging with clients. And so these use cases are very real and they're happening now. So Hadoop is a boardroom discussion or big data? I mean, I just can't see boardroom. Oh, we should have more Hadoop or is it? You know, do you I, see? I've <laughs> seen it over and over again. I'll tell you okay. where you see a lot okay. from is companies that are private equity owned. Um, the private equity guys have figured out that there's savings and there's innovation here. Yeah. Every company I worked with that has private equity ownership, Hadoop is a boardroom discussion. And the idea is how do we modernize the infrastructure because and it's, it's because of other forces though, it's because of mobile, it's because of cloud, that comes to the forefront, so absolutely. Yeah. 
So, so let's take Hadoop. So Hadoop is great batch, it's great, there's a lot of innovations going on there. Boardroom in these private equities, because one, they're cutting edge, probably they're like an investment they want to see yeah. realize pretty quickly. Yeah. Speed is critical, right? I would infer that was coming from the private equity side. Speed is critical, right? So speed to value, what does that mean for IBM and your customers? How do you guys deliver the speed to value? Because that's one of the things that comes out in all the premises of all the conversations is, hey, you can do things faster now. So value on the business side, where do you guys see that? Sure, so um, a lot of different ways to approach that. So we believe that, as I said, when I said before, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's about the insight. We build a lot of analytic capabilities into what we're doing around Hadoop and Spark so that clients can get the answers faster. So one thing that we're going to be, we have a session here at Strata this week talking about our new innovations in Big R, which is our, our algorithms, which are the only R algorithms that you can run natively on Hadoop, where your statistical programmers can suddenly start to um, you know, analyze data and you know, drive that to decision making as an example. So we believe that by providing the analytics on top of the infrastructure, you can, you can change how clients are getting value out of that. So how do we do it quickly? Um, we've got IBM software, so we've got our Hadoop um, infrastructure up on the cloud, so anybody can go provision something and get started in hours, which is not something that was the case even a couple years ago. And so speed is important, but the tools and how you get the insight is equally important. How about speed to, to value from a customer deployment standpoint? Is it the apps or is it innovating on existing? Yeah. Well, what, what do you see? Well, <clears throat> I think it's both actually. Um, and, and so you talked earlier about system of engagement versus system of record. You know, and I think at the end of the day, um, for clients, it's really about systems of insight, which is some combination of that, right? We tend to think the systems of engagement are the newer things and the newer applications, and we tend to think the systems of record are the older ones, but I think it's a combination of it. And we see it show up in different ways. So um, I'll take an example of Telco. And we have a solution, um, the Now Factory, and this is now about applying analytics in real time um, about the uh, network and the dynamics so that, for example, the operator has a better view of what's happening for their customers, their end users, and they can tell that an application has gone down and that customers have now switched all of a sudden to using a competitive application on their mobile devices. You know, that's different, and that is that new applications or old, or is it the combination? And I think at the end of the day, it really comes to a combination. I love these systems of insight. I'm just going to write that down here inside the uh, inside the crowd chat. So um, I got to talk about the um, the holy grail for big data analytics and big data from your perspective, to IBM's perspective, and two, where you guys are partnering. Obviously, here this is a show of uh, rich targets of accu hires, uh, acquisitions, <laughs> partnerships. I mean, it's really a fertile ground, certainly Silicon Valley, and and in the growth of, of big data, cloud, mobile, and social, kind of these infrastructure things coming together. Um, what is the holy grail from your perspective? Obviously, these systems of insight teases that out. Um, cognitive is a, is a message we've heard. Um, so what is the holy grail? And then what are you guys looking for in partnerships and in, within the community of startups and or uh, other alliances? Sure, do you want to start with the holy grail view? <laughs> yeah, so, um, <laughs> so, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, it is about using technology for business value and business outcome. I, I, you know, I, I really think that's what's at the spirit of it. And so if, if I tell you why we have, for example, increased our in attention and investment around this topic, it's because of that. It's because of what Rob said earlier when he said the state that clients are now in. Um, so that's what I think is really important there. And I think it's only going to be successful if it's done based on standards and something that is in support of you know, heterogeneous environments. I mean, that's the world of technology that we live in, and that's a critical element of it, which leads to why we are a part of the Open Data uh, Platform Initiative. So on the, on the, um, the piece of analytics, I'm, I was just saw a comment about R, for example, uh, I was just mentioned in the crowd chat. Um, I, Microsoft just bought Revolution Analytics, which is not R, which is a different community. Um, is there a land grab going on between the big guys? I mean, you know, IBM's a big company. Um, what do you guys see in that kind of area in terms of acquisition targets? Yeah, I mean, I think the numbers would say there's not a land grab. I don't think the M&A numbers have changed um, at a macro level at all in the last couple of years. 
I mean, we're very opportunistic in our strategy, right? We look for things that augment what we do. I think, you know, uh, it's related to the partner on uh, your, your question around partnering, but when we do acquisitions, it's not only about what that company does, but it's about how does it fit within what IBM already does because we're trying to, you know, we're going after a rising tide in terms of how we deliver what clients need. I think some companies make that mistake. They think that if they have a great product, that's relevant to us. Maybe, maybe not, but it's about how it fits in what we're doing. And that's how we look at all of our partnerships, really. And, you know, we partner with global systems integrators, even though we have one within IBM. We partner with ISVs, application developers. The big push this week, as I described before, is around data scientists. So we're rolling out data science education on Big Data University because we think that data scientists will quickly find that the best place to do that is on an IBM platform because it's the best tools. And if they can provide better insight to their companies or to their clients, they're going to be better off. So I was, uh, yesterday I was uh, commenting on, um, and certainly the end of last week and earlier this week about uh, Twitter, you know, there's a lot of comment and Twitter's figured it out and people are confused by Twitter versus Facebook and I know IBM has a, a relationship with Twitter so it's just, that's why it popped in my head. And I was always saying, hey, Twitter's got great value and so I was on the side of, you know, Twitter's a winner, I love Twitter, I love the company. Um, misunderstood, certainly, I think. Um, in this market where there's waves coming in more and more, there's a lot of misunderstanding, and I think I want to get your perspective, if you can share with the folks out there, what is that next wave? Because it's confusing out there. You guys are insiders. IBM, I would say, like Twitter, is, is winning, doing very well. Certainly, we're up close to you guys. We are, we're, we're deeply reporting on IBM, so we can see the momentum and the positioning. It's all in line what we see is, that, is, is where the outcomes will end up being for customers. But there's still a lot of naysayers out there. Certainly you guys have had your share, as, as is Twitter's as an example. So what is the big misunderstanding that uh, you think is, is out there around the market we're in? And what's the next wave? I mean, there's always waves coming in. If you're not out in front of that next wave, you usually drift with, as the old expression goes. So what is that m big misunderstanding in this kind of converged, kind of hyper-targeted with analytics? This is all new stuff, huge opportunities, huge shifts and inflection point, as Bob Picciano said on theCUBE. It's kind of both going on at the same time. Yeah. Huge shift and an inflection point. So what's misunderstood and what's that next big waves? So, let me start with the next big wave, then I'll back into the, the misunderstanding. So the next big wave to me is machine learning. And how do you start to take the data assets that you have, and through machine learning and the application of those type of algorithms, you start to generate better insights or outcomes. And the reason I think it's the next big wave is it's, it may be one of the last competitive moats out there. If you think about it, if you have a, a corpus of data that's unique to you, and you can practice machine learning on that and have that you know, either data that you can sell or to feed into your core business, that's something that nobody else can replicate. So it becomes incredibly powerful. Um, so one example I'll share with you, and uh, I wanted to bring you my book, but it's actually not getting published till next week. So, <laughs> so maybe next week. But uh, so Wiley's publishing a book I wrote, and one of the examples I give is a company by the name of CoStar, which I think very few people have heard of. Um, CoStar is in the commercial real estate business. They weren't even around a decade ago. They have skyrocketed you know, from zero to $500 million in revenue. And it's because they have data on four million commercial properties out there. Who else has that? Absolutely nobody has that kind of reach. And so they've got a unique data asset. They can apply things like machine learning and statistics to that. And therefore, anybody who wants to do anything in commercial real estate has to start with them. So my point is, you're starting to get to the point where you have some businesses where data is the product. Mm -hmm. It's not an enabler, it's the actual product. And I think that's probably one of the big misunderstandings out there is that you know, data is just something that serves our existing products or existing services. We're moving to a world where data is the product and that's the moat. I wrote a post in 2008 called Data is the New Development Kit and what you're basically saying is that's the competitive advantage a business user can make an innovation observation about data and not be a scientist and right. change the game. That's what you were saying earlier, similar? That's right, that's right. Okay, so next big wave, misunderstanding. What do you, what, Beth, what's your take on, what are people not getting? What is Wall Street, what is uh, potential, well the VC's really on the front end of some of the innovation, but what is the general public not getting? I mean, we are in a shift and an inflection point. What's the, what's the big shift and misunderstanding going on? So, so I, I would tend to, you know, actually agree with, with Rob, that I think folks aren't yet um, really appreciating, and, and I guess I would twist it a little bit and say the insight um, instead of just the data, but but they're not realizing what that is and what it's going to give us the opportunity for. 
you know, um, I would retire early if I actually could predict everything that was going to happen. <laughs> but, but you, you know, <laughs> yeah. But if you think about it, you know, if you think about, you know, mid to late nineties, and what we would have all thought that the internet was going to allow us to do, compared to what it actually allowed us to do, is probably like night and day. And I think the the time we're in now, when you take data and you take um, mobility and you take cloud and you take these systems of engagement and the fact the way people individuals actually want to do things is is similar but almost like on steroids to what we were dealing with in the the mid 90s or so and so you know the possibilities are are frankly endless and and i think that's part of what people aren't necessarily realizing is that they have to think about that insight, that data that actually has some value to it in very different ways. Yeah, there's a lot of disruptive enablers out there, and, and there's a lot to look at, but finding which ones will be the biggest right. is hard. I mean, you, right. get, you get paid a lot of money to do that, right. I guess, if you can figure it out and keep it a secret, yeah. um, which you didn't. You, machine learning is now out there. You just shared with us a competitive it? advantage, so everyone knows. Uh, no, everyone kind of knew that, <laughs> kind of in the inside. But, but not everybody's point. using it, right? Yeah. I mean, I think another example, a company like Intuit has done a great job of, they started off as a software company, they've become a data company. I think what you, what I've observed in all these companies is you can build a business model that's effectively recession-proof because data becomes the IP in the organization. And so I don't, I actually, you know, I think for us, those that live in the world, we think this is well understood. I don't think it's that well understood right. yet. Yeah, insiders right. might. Yeah. Right, and you know, when we first started doing um, big data research and working with thousands of clients around the world, there were, there were six basic use cases. It started, of course, with the customer, the, the end customer and the customer 360 and that sort of thing. And went through a number of different things around um, optimization, et cetera. But the additional one is about those new business models. And, you know, that is clearly in the last 12 to 18 months has become a lot more of what the topic is when I'm talking to clients. Um, and I think we will see that expand even more as we go in the future. Well, we have a lot of activity on the CrowdChat, crowdchat.net slash Hadoop next. And uh, I'll, I'll mention that we can probably extend time on that uh, if you guys want to uh, keep it keep it going, the conversation is awesome. I mean, we did getting the hook here, um, um, so we'll move the conversation to crowdchat.net slash Hadoop next. Great thought leadership, and I can go on this for an hour. You guys are awesome. Great to have you on the cube. Thank so you. much to talk about. A lot of ground. We'll certainly see it interconnect. Go. Final question for you guys is: What do you guys see for this week? Real quick, summarize. What do you expect to see unfold for Big Data Week here at Silicon Valley? Big Data SV. So I think. You know, it's a lot of the, what we talked about. Machine learning is going to be a big topic. I think there'll be a lot of discussion around the open data platform that Beth mentioned before. It's a big move that, that we made along with another group supporting the Apache Software Foundation. I think that, that's a big thing for this week. Um, but it should be exciting. <laughs> All right. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. IBM here inside theCUBE. We're live in Silicon Valley. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. I'm John Furrier. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Andrew Kreitzer, a business operations manager at LinkedIn, and you're watching The Cube. I'm Chris Sellen, VP of Business Development for HP Big Data, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, I'm Stacy Slaughter, Senior Vice President of Communications for the Giants. I'm in the garden at AT&T Park, and you're watching The Cube. I'm Thomas Minnick, Business Intelligence Consultant with InnerWorks, and you're watching theCUBE. Hi, my name is David Tishkart, Director of Partner Marketing at Cloudera, and you're watching theCUBE. Hi, I'm Jim Yu, Founder and CEO of Bright Edge, and you're watching theCUBE.
Citizen scientists are very important in the data collection efforts in studying climate change because there are not enough resources by the National Park Service to do these data collections. I love data and I love national parks and I'm here to help in any way I can through data science. Earthwatch is an organization that does citizen science, giving people intense one or two week long experiences where they come and participate actively in a science project. And that can be a transformative experience. Engaging the public in doing the science gives them a deeper understanding of the problems and they're able to collect data in the intertidal or watch birds. People who are not professional scientists out there asking questions, helping to answer those questions, analyzing the data. I think it's such a treat to be a, a citizen scientist. It reminds you of your childhood, of getting in touch with these things that were all around you and are so easy to let fall by the wayside. It's so easy to pick up your phone and forget. Going out and touching and interacting with science, it's just like being, being a kid again, being that invigorated to learn. We, we picked periwinkles off of the intertidal and learned about different species, and then we put them back gently. We're very good at collecting the data and getting, sending it off to these different databases, but we're bad at making those data discoverable. We are compiling the list of data sources so that we can put together a data lake where all data related to climate change will be stored and will be queried and will be analyzed. It would be data about weather, it would be data about the abundance of different species, the disappearance rate of different species. It is gonna help them solve those problems at a massive scale, which they so far haven't been able to do by looking at smaller chunks of data. We're on a highway for bird migrations. Most of those birds are arriving later, so they're migrating later in the fall. But the fruits are ripening earlier in the fall. And so these, these birds are arriving after many of the fruits have ripened and maybe aren't even around anymore. And so they don't have the food they need to fuel up to finish their migration on their way to Central or South America. And so you can end up losing a lot of those birds. That's the sad part of it. And, and what I try to do is, is also think of the optimistic side, the part that we can do something about. And that's where I think this partnership with EMC could help us really make a meaningful difference. Points in your life like this just reignite that fire. Within a few hours, I think people got it, how EMC technology and how pivotal is technology can result in these people being able to do new science, to be able to get new discoveries, to be able to do their job, not just better, but in a way they've never been able to do it before. A real data lake solution that EMC is already in the process of building. It gives us a really great opportunity to dig in and give them access to tools and to visualizations that can inspire the future generations of scientists. Imagine you entering a portal where you see interesting relationships between different climate variables and its impact on a certain plant and animal species and see the impact visually. Every person in the room is thinking about how it grows, how it becomes a bigger effort, how, we, how can we incorporate more data, what's coming next. I want kids to look back in textbooks and think that we were the generation that had the opportunity and we took it. We did everything we could. We didn't say, oh, well, somebody will deal with it later. When we first started talking about partnering with EMC on a project like this to help with citizen science, help with conservation, I was surprised that they were interested in it and have been really impressed by the level of staff and the quality of the people that, that are here. Really talented people that bring a lot of experience and different perspectives. Really exciting to see the engagement and how much EMC really does want to make a difference. Tell me and I may forget, teach me and I may remember, but involve me and I learn. And to be able to make a small dent which reverses this process would be a huge satisfaction for me as a data scientist and more importantly for me as a human being on this planet.
Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Okay, hello everyone, I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE, The Cube, and I'm here live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV 2015. This is our second time in Silicon Valley, our fourth big data event where we are out getting all the data from what's happening in the industry and sharing that with you in conjunction with Strata Conference Hadoop World, which is going on right across the street. Again, we are bringing live interviews, coverage, analysis here with The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm with Jeff Kelly, co-host for the week here at Big Data Analysis, Wikibon.org, and uh, we're excited to share with you all the exciting uh, news, of analysis, events, and there's a ton to talk about. So, uh, you know, Jeff and I will be here all week, bringing three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage here in Silicon Valley and San Jose around big data, and a lot of news, people going public, new startups are coming out of the woodwork, big players, uh, and, and the theme really is follow the money, and, and we're excited to have a big event tonight. Uh, Jeff Kelly will be sharing some research, and we're having a party tonight at seven o'clock here at the Fairmont, so if you're watching, Swing by at 5 o'clock for our presentation, and then party at 7 here at theCUBE. Again, our fourth event, second time, second year here in Silicon Valley, Big Data SV. Uh, we have a crowd chat, crowdchat.net slash big data week is the URL. Come join the conversation. Uh, Jeff, uh, exciting week. We have tons of news. Uh, obviously, Pivotal and Hortonworks and industry announced an open data platform. Um, Cloudera has uh, kind of hinted they're going to go public, release some numbers around their earnings, and just in general, the, the philosophy for the startups is, I got to find a home and I got to find some customers. So um, I want to get your take. I mean, what's, what, do you, what do you see? You've been here uh, on the ground with Pivotal. Um, what's, what's the story? What's happening? Yeah, so I was at the Pivotal event yesterday when they announced a few things. The open data platform, essentially a new industry consortium focused on um, hardening the Hadoop core to enable you know, more enterprise adoption. Um, some pretty big names that are part of that uh, group, uh, the ODP, so you've got Pivotal, you've got Hortonworks, IBM, uh, you've got GE, Verizon, some others. Um, so that was a pretty big announcement, as you mentioned. Um, from uh, continuing on kind of Pivotal with their news, they've open sourced their entire big data suite of products. That's the Greenplum database, Hawk, which is essentially their uh, massively parallel analytic database that runs native on Hadoop, uh, Gemfire for uh, essentially more transactional big data. So, you know, they're going all in with open source between the ODP and uh, with uh, that announcement around open sourcing those tools. They've tightened their alliance with Hortonworks. Uh, going to make all those big data tools, the, the Pivotal tool is now um, able to run on Hortonworks data platform, their Hadoop distribution. So a lot happening there. Um, kind of almost in, you could say, in the other camp. We've got Cloudera, made some announcements as well, uh, announcing that they've hit $100 million in, in revenue in their fiscal year 2015. Um, so, you know, interesting, that's the first uh, Hadoop distribution player to hit that mark, so that's a big, that's a big milestone for them. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing here is the, the swim lanes are starting to really solidify. You've, you've got uh, the open data platform and that group of companies uh, on one side, and then you've kind of got Cloudera and Intel kind of in their camp, uh, which you know is actually not a bad thing for the market. You're starting to see um, some, some contraction, some consolidation, I should say, in terms of the different players. Um, and it's good that there's a couple different options that cu customers have uh, when it comes to Hadoop and big data, but I think you're seeing this market mature, um, and that's a good sign. From a practitioner standpoint, what we're looking to, to talk about this week, of course, is you know where, where does it stand in terms of adoption of Hadoop generally, um, but, but big data even more broadly uh, in the enterprise. Um, so we'll be, we'll be very interested to hear from some of the practitioners that are going to join us on the Cube uh, over the next couple of days about that. Um, you know, what we're seeing in the market, uh, talking to the Wikibon community and the research we're doing, you know, we're finding there's, this, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum in terms of adoption of Hadoop. You're seeing the big global 1,000 companies, they're, they're all going in with Hadoop um, for sure, there's no question about that. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got some of the smaller, what I would say, born data-driven startups, uh, where they have big data kind of built into their DNA. Um, you know, and they're going in, certainly with Hadoop and some of the other uh, developing technologies, Spark, et cetera. So you've got those two factions, but then you've got this big middle, uh, the rest of the enterprise landscape. And there's not a lot of action happening right, right in that space. So we'll be talking to practitioners, we'll be talking to the vendors, uh, we'll talk to the VCs, how are we going to, uh, 
move that forward so we start to see some adoption beyond those really big enterprises and then of course those really nimble, exciting data startups. Um, and in terms of the state of adoption or, or the success of those that have adopted Hadoop, we'll talk about that. Um, and the, fr the, the fact is, even some of those early adopters are, are struggling. Um, it's still a challenge. There's still a lot of different pieces that you need to put together to make big data work. Uh, and even some of the big banks and some of the big retailers who are kind of the, the big name brands that are out there and are touted by the Hadoop companies as, hey, they're using Hadoop. Even those companies are struggling a little bit. So we'll talk about that and what it's going to take to kind of move that, that forward. Let's take a step back and just look at the big picture. So obviously we've been covering big data since the, really the inception of the industry. We saw Hadoop come on the scene and explode. Obviously that became uh, a huge trend. You're seeing a standardization now happening with Pivotal and Hortonworks in the industry rallying around a standard that's in direct conflict with what Cloudera is saying. They obviously didn't join the alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have um, the general enterprise market and, and then also the capital market. So I want to get your perspective. Um, we had the big data New York City event, which really focused on Wall Street, the capital markets in New York. Mm -hmm. Here in Silicon Valley, we're looking at the money side of the, the private side. So, you know, obviously Cloudera is not yet public. Uh, Hortonworks is public. And then you have a slew of startups out there trying to find a, a position, if, if you will, swim lanes, as you say, for the big guys. And the little guys are trying to find a spot. So, yeah. so I mean, where are we? Obviously, phases of, of evolution. We've seen phase one. We've been talking about that on the Cube. you know, the early adopters. Are we in phase two? Are we crossing the chasm? You know, we were speculating that big data might not be an industry, but might be more cloud-driven. Um, Where's the side? So factions kind of solidify. Um, I would put you know one bucket the ODP that's Pivotal, Hortonworks, IBM, and, and GE, and some of that group. On the other side, you're seeing Intel and Cloudera. Um, I might even throw Amazon into that bucket as well. Um, so I think you're starting to see that, which is which is I think a natural thing in the market. You start to see a couple of dominant players start to emerge. In this case, not individual players, but but factions. Um, now the interesting question, of course, is you know we're, we're Strata Hadoop World is happening this week, and if you go down to the show and you go to the show floor, there's dozens of startups out there in the space. Um, many of them focused on fairly niche tooling in the larger big data stack. And the question is, what's going to happen happen to those players? Um, you know, I, one of the challenges of this market, for, if you're a startup, is that big data requires, and we, we've learned this, you know, by talking to a lot of practitioners. Um, in the enterprise, but big data requires more of a platform approach. Um, there are a lot of moving parts, and for this to go mainstream, most enterprises don't have the internal resources, bandwidth, expertise, what have you, to bring together all these disparate tools, bring them together, cobble them together into their own platform. They are looking for more of a uh, one-stop shop for big data. Um, we saw this in the data warehouse space to some extent, where the appliance model, bringing the hardware and software together, drop kind of data warehouse in a box, drop it in your data center, you know, that really had became, has become the standard approach for data warehousing. Um, and we're starting to see that in the big data space. Um, now the interesting caveat there, of course, is open source, uh, where you didn't have that in the data warehouse space. Uh, and that's the, the good news is that Innovation, I believe, is going to continue even as we start to see some consolidation um, and more of a platform play around big data. Uh, but back to those little startups, I think the challenge for them is going to be, you know, how do you build a business around a particular tool that needs to fit into a larger platform, the big data stack, if you will, that itself needs to fit into the larger data management stack, needs to fit into the larger infrastructure and some of the innovation that's happening on, on that side in terms of cloud and virtualization. So it's, it's going to be hard for those players to build, I think, um, long-term sustainable businesses. What I think the good news is I think some of those players out on that floor today will have some good exits You're gonna, because there is going to be consolidation in this market and some of the tooling that they're creating is very valuable. Um, so for some of those, there's going to be a good exit. For others, you know, there's, there's not going to be such a good exit. But you know, that's the nature of a new market and venture capital flowing in, and that's, that's just the way markets we work. Can't, we can't not talk about the big three, Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapR, obviously the, the, the innovators early in phase one, obviously. Sure. Are they going to get the leverage in this phase two? Um, what's the early adopters on the enterprise look like? And obviously, where are the capital markets? Obviously, those big three are, are mm -hmm. heavily funded. What's your take on those three guys? Well, if you look at those three players, uh, like I said, I think you're seeing a couple, couple of different factions play out, or, or develop, I should say. Um, they are extremely well capitalized. Um, you know, between the three of them, I think, raised over $1.6 billion. Uh, over the last several years. And of course, Hortonworks has gone public and raised another 100 million plus in their, in their um, IPO. Uh, so they're very well capitalized. The question is, where's, where's all that money going to go? And, and, and why, is there, why is there a need for that much capital in this market? Because isn't software supposed to be you know, cap not so capital intensive in terms of uh, building out a business? Um, the challenges in the Hadoop business are 
a few things. One, uh, from a distribution perspective, you've got a, you've got, it takes time to, to build a, a business based on open source software. You've got the community to contend with, and then you've also got to deal with your channel. You've got to get, you've got to get, you've got to break into the um, more traditional way of enter enterprises buying software. So that takes time, and then of course you've got to compete with the mindshare. Uh, you've got to compete from a mindshare perspective with all the big players who have lots of money and are very uh, invested in this business as well, whether it's Microsoft or Oracle or whoever. So that's where a lot of this money is going. Uh, you know, what's going to play out in terms of you know, who's going to be around in five, ten years? It'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think this market can sustain one, maybe two players uh, at a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned three vendors, so you know, will, will all of them? And there's a lot of other little guys. I mean, there's a lot of consolidation going on. That's your premise of your of your research. Well, You're right. sending that tonight at five o'clock tonight. Uh, have an event. So, um, what's your take on on consolidation? Like Carnage, said, Accu hires, IPOs. Well, what's going on? I think you're going to see you're going to see continued consolidation. We've already started to see it. Um, kind of on the periphery, we've seen companies, you know, and certainly in the open source business intelligence space, with Pentaho, JasperSoft being acquired, Revolution Analytics. Um, I think you're going to continue to see that uh, that happen in this uh, in the Hadoop space in particular, uh, because, like I said, a lot of these different tools, while very, very valuable, really only become extremely valuable when they're part of a larger larger platform. So you're going to definitely see some ac uh, some consolidation there, some acquisitions, and I think that's natural. It's good for the market. You know, the enterprise and the enterprise is telling us this. This is what they're you know we at the uh, pivotal event yesterday there was a um, they had a customer panel and one of the customers I think said it pretty well, uh, Mitsubishi Financial, and they talked about well we need to take a platform approach because we don't have the time. We're not in the business of, of piecing together all these little uh, these little tools and and technologies into a platform. We we do want a kind of a one stop shop. At the same time, they don't want lock in. And the good news is, open source uh, to some extent alleviates that risk uh, of vendor lock in, and that's what the ODP is all about. Now, of course, there's some debate going on with ODP. You've got Clara making some comments about how it's kind of ant antithetical to the open source way, um, and I think there is a legitimate question that the ODP has to ask has to answer, I should say, which is why do, you, why do you need such an organization? What is ODP going to do that the Apache community can't do? So I got to ask you, yesterday we had a crowd chat, it's still open right now, crowdchat.net slash big data week, and obviously Dave Vellante laid down some interesting comments who he couldn't make up this week, it snowed in in Boston. So Dave, if you're watching, we miss you, wish you were here uh, to add some of the commentary, because you know what's clear is, is that big data seems to be, and this is what I was speculating, and Dave was kind of teasing it out, that it's kind of transitioning to a new wave coming in. You know, things happen in waves, wave one, wave two. Is the big data wave dying out or, or being diluted, if you will, and moving to a whole other level, whether that's virtualization, you're seeing a lot of conversations on our crowd chat about converged infrastructure, stuff mm -hmm. storage, you got VMware doing some things, we covered that at recent announcement. So is the dynamics uh, at infrastructure scale affecting the big data business? And if Hadoop can become standardized and you're starting to see a rally around that, is this next wave going to be uh, something different? Is it going to look uh, different, the same? What do you see? Mm -hmm. Obviously big data is not just data warehousing, that's one aspect of it. You know, obviously w w there's other things that could propel this growth. And so you know, some speculating there's a bubble that's going to burst. Is there another wave? Because bubbles don't burst if there's another wave coming. And that's what Dave was basically saying. I think there's definitely another wave coming. And it's characterized by three things. So number one, you're starting to see this consolidation around Hadoop as really a, the core foundation of a big data platform. Um, things like the ODP are going to accelerate enterprise adoption. I think there's no question that that's, that's kind of part of the next phase. Like I said, the good news is you know, the, the innovation isn't going to stop, and that's because of the open source community. Um, so there's going to be continued innovation uh, from, if, if from no one else, from the practitioners out there who are developing these tools themselves. The data-born startups, companies like Facebook and Google, and even Netflix is now open sourcing some of their Hadoop-related tools. So you're going to continue to see innovation. And that's what I think one of the key factors that the open source brings to this market. Um, and then the last and really important part of this phase is where it gets really interesting is new applications, and specifically applications around the Internet of Things uh, and the industrial internet. That's where it's going to get exciting, where you're actually, we're moving beyond kind of the container, oh, how do we store and do some processing of all this data? How do we save a little bit of money on our data warehousing? Moving from that to how do we do things in a totally different way? How do we develop new lines of business, drive new revenue? How do we find efficiencies? You think about some of the things GE is doing among, around, um, you know, uh, 
predictive maintenance kind of things. You know, just a little bit of, yeah. a, of a shift in terms of your efficiency there can mean big money. So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the action, and that's what's going to be very exciting in the next phase of big data. Well, it's going to be an exciting week. I'm looking forward to looking at a couple key areas on my radar, which is the, con you know, the, the, the overlay between different markets. I'll see cloud is exploding. you got the converged infrastructure mark. I'll call that infrastructure. And you got big data. I'll call that apps and others. Where you got DevOps, you got Internet of Things, big data, data warehousing, and I'll see infrastructure with virtualization and, and stuff overlay, overlaying. So I think there's going to be a concentric circles around those markets. And what's interesting is, is that the interplay between those, uh, those forces is going to be very interesting to watch. And I see big data, you know, kind of diluting into its own little market where Internet of Things traverses DevOps and infrastructure. So I think that's clearly a big wave. But I'm really interested to see, you know, what I call infrastructure software. Software eating the world by Mark Andreessen, certainly a relevant soundbite. But the reality is, is that are we just in a new market called infrastructure software? And I think that is where these concentric circles come in. So I'm really interested to dig into these forces. We'll be covering it for three days. This is theCUBE, live in Silicon Valley in conjunction with Strata Conference and Hadoop World. This is Big Data SV, our exclusive event here, Silicon Angle, Wikibon. We'll be right back with our next guest after the short break. Stay tuned for three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Andrew Kreitzer, a Business Operations Manager at LinkedIn, and you're watching The Cube. I'm Chris Sellen, VP of Business Development for HP Big Data, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, I'm Stacy Slaughter, Senior Vice President of Communications for the Giants. I'm in the garden at AT&T Park, and you're watching The Cube. I'm Thomas Minnick, Business Intelligence Consultant with InnerWorks, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, my name is David Tishkart, Director of Partner Marketing at Cloudera, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, I'm Jim Yu, Founder and CEO of Bright Edge, and you're watching The Cube. Citizen scientists are very important in the data collection efforts in studying climate change because there are not enough resources by the National Park Service to do these data collections. I love data and I love national parks and I'm here to help in any way I can through data science. EarthWatch is an organization that does citizen science, giving people intense one or two week long experiences where they come and participate actively in a science project, and that can be a transformative experience. Engaging the public in doing the science gives them a deeper understanding of the problems, and they're able to collect data in the inner tidal or watch birds. People who are not professional scientists out there asking questions, helping to answer those questions, analyzing the data. I think it's such a treat to be a, a citizen scientist. It reminds you of your childhood, of getting in touch with these things that were all around you. and are so easy to let fall by the wayside. It's so easy to pick up your phone and forget. Going out and touching and interacting with science, it's just like being, being a kid again, being that invigorated to learn. We, we picked periwinkles off of the intertidal and learned about different species, and then we put them back gently. We're very good at collecting the data and getting, sending it off to these different databases, but we're bad at making those data discoverable. We are compiling the list of data sources so that we can put together a data lake where all data related to climate change will be stored and will be queried and will be analyzed. It would be data about weather, it would be data about the abundance of different species, the disappearance rate of different species. It is going to help them solve those problems at a massive scale which they so far haven't been able to do 
by looking at smaller chunks of data. We're on a highway for bird migrations. Most of those birds are arriving later, so they're migrating later in the fall. But the fruits are ripening earlier in the fall. And so these, these birds are arriving after many of the fruits have ripened and maybe aren't even around anymore. And so they don't have the food they need to fuel up to finish their migration on their way to Central or South America. And so you can end up losing a lot of those birds. That's the sad part of it. And, and what I try to do is, is also think of the optimistic side, the part that we can do something about. And that's where I think this partnership with EMC could help us really make a meaningful difference. Points in your life like this just reignite that fire. Within a few hours, I think people got it, how EMC technology and how pivotal is technology can result in these people being able to do new science, to be able to get new discoveries, to be able to do their job, not just better, but in a way they've never been able to do it before. A real data lake solution that EMC is already in the process of building. It gives us a really great opportunity to dig in and give them access to tools and to visualizations that can inspire the future generations of scientists. Imagine you entering a portal where you see interesting relationships between different climate variables and its impact on a certain plant and animal species and see the impact visually. Every person in the room is thinking about how it grows, how it becomes a bigger effort, how, we, how can we incorporate more data, what's coming next. I want kids to look back in textbooks and think that we were the generation that had the opportunity and we took it. We did everything we could. We didn't say, oh, well, somebody will deal with it later. When we first started talking about partnering with EMC on a project like this to help with citizen science, help with conservation, I was surprised that they were interested in it and have been really impressed by the level of staff and the quality of the people that, that are here. Really talented people that bring a lot of experience and different perspectives. Really exciting to see the engagement and how much EMC really does want to make a difference. Tell me and I may forget, teach me and I may remember, but involve me and I learn. And to be able to make a small dent which reverses this process would be a huge satisfaction for me as a data scientist and more importantly for me as a human being on this planet. Hi, I'm George Matthew, President and CEO of Altrix, and you're watching The Cube. I'm Dimitri Zemin, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Stackstorm, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, I'm Greg Scher, Vice President of Product Strategy at QLogic, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, my name is Ben Jones, yeah, Senior Product Manager of Tableau software. Public, we're Tableau Software, and you're watching The Cube. Hi, this is Francois from Tableau, and you're watching The Cube.